So, <clears throat> the after lunch, uh, we are going to uh, continue our session 21, and this session is dedicated to the nanomedicines against, uh, in and against, uh, I don't, don't understand why in, in and against infection and inflammation. And we have uh, six speakers here and have nine minutes, and each speaker has 15 minutes, uh, including discussion. So, uh, Switzerland two, Deutschland one, uh, Netherlands one, and Korea two. So, you might expect uh, the uh, new realm of uh, uh, the nanomedicine news. So, the first speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Francesco Stellacci. Uh, he is going to talk about the nanoparticles as antivirals. Please. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, I will uh, tell you today things that in my group we are doing against viral infections. So it should be uh, known that about half of uh, mortality due to inf diseases in the world is due to infective diseases. And a big share of that comes from viral diseases. The reason for these large mortalities are multiple, but among them you can actually appreciate in this slide here the fact that there are many known human conditions that generate diseases and many known viruses that attack humans, but uh, only a subset of them uh, are, have uh, vaccinations and an other, even smaller fraction have approved drugs. So for the most part, when you have a viral infection, you're on your own. Your immune system has to respond to the viral infection, otherwise things will not end up in a positive way. Now, uh, there are three big classes of drugs that we currently use against viruses. And they are divided into antivirals. These are drugs that block the um, replication of viruses intracellularly. They are the only truly FDA-approved drugs, but have a problem that every virus uh, uses a different pathway for replication, and a lot of viruses, not all, change the pathway upon mutation. So these drugs actually are very virus-specific. And hence, they're good when you have a known virus that is a target. But if you want to develop a new drug for all of the viruses that were in black there, that will be a very tall order. Also, you'll be, uh, you won't have time to develop a drug like this in case of an emerging disease, because it takes too much time. Obviously, one then, say, then comes to the conclusion that what we would need would be broad spectrum drugs. Drugs that are like broad spectrum antibiotics that would be developed and work on a very large number of viruses and potentially on viruses we don't know of that will be emerging. That would be ideal and also economically ideal because a lot of these viruses have high incidence of deaths uh, in African countries where there is not a lot of money to pay for the development of these drugs, so developing a single one would be great. Now, there exist a few ideas on how to make broad-spectrum antiviral drug. They need to work outside the cell, not inside the cell. So they need to work in this stage here of a, uh, viral replication. They are called virucidal when they block viral infection in an irreversible way. To trivialize this, if a virus was alive, I could say they kill a virus. Now, there are many, many virucidal molecules, for example, strong acid, strong surfactants, or pure alcohol, but they're not drugs because they are actually toxic to the virus, but as well to the host. And this, if you look at how a virus replicates, is kind of obvious because a virus replicates inside a host using host material, so it's chemically done in the same way. The other approach is called virostatic. It typically consists in imitating a cell receptor that attaches to the viral ligands and by attaching there prevents viral entry. These uh, drugs, these molecules, are non-toxic 
because they imitate something that already exists in nature, and they are broad spectrum because human viruses all uh, I have as a ta one ligand that is highly conserved. It's called the attachment ligand, and the target for the attachment ligand is one of three cell receptor: sialic acid, uh, heparin sulfate um, uh, proteoglycan, sialic acid, or CAR receptor. So there's only three targets. Each one of them, roughly, you can say it's one third of uh, viruses. So you can do them broad spectral. The problem with these drugs is they are, they are based on a binding event. And binding events upon dilution below of a binding constant lead to the detachment of the two things that bound. And in this case, release a perfectly infective viruses. So while it, it is very easy to actually, for example, focus on this particular uh, target of the attachment ligand and have a drug that can actually block in vitro all of these viruses. So you see it goes from dengue to hepatitis to HIV, uh, Ebola, Zika. It is easy to do that in vitro. It, i it is impossible to do that in in vivo, and people have tried and all failed, because upon dilution in bodily fluid, you will release a perfectly infective virus that will restart the replication mechanism. So the conundrum here is that we have in vitro ideal drugs, they are broad spectrum as we need them, they are non-toxic, um, and in fact, the king or the queen of these drugs is heparin, FDA-approved drugs, in vitro will block all of the viruses I showed you before. But they are reversible, and this makes them medically irrelevant. That's a summary. One more thing to add for a nanoparticle person like me, among the many, many literature that you can find on this, people have developed gold nanoparticles that behave like heparin, and in vitro they block the infection. So what did we do in my group? We said we need to make that attachment irreversible. So we need to make the attachment as an initial step of a series of biological events that ends in an irreversible uh, pathway. If we do that, we can have the magic bullet. I'm exaggerating, but we can have a drug that is close to ideal in terms of antivirals. We started with nanoparticles that we studied for years that have very low toxicity, um, and we've gone all the way to test them in pigs at 15 times the concentration I'll talk today about with no effect, no, no visible toxic effect. When we actually take these particles and we mix them with um, um, lentivirus, so HIV virus, genetically modified to be green fluorescent expressing, what we find is that as long as we have sulfonic acid on the nanoparticle, we get nanomolar inhibition of a virus. This is great because all our literature that I showed you before has nanomolar inhibition, inhibition in vitro, but also it's great because in this test, all FDA-approved drugs are nanomolar. So we are in the same level with literature and we are same level with FDA-approved drugs. After that, thanks to a grateful collaboration with David Lembo, we went to uh, wild-type viruses, so viruses extracted from patients, not genetically modified, and we have nanomolar inhibition of these viruses, all of them, uh, herpes simplex virus 1, herpes simplex virus 2, and papilloma virus. The key point is, so far, what I've shown you is that our drug work exactly like the literature, but we designed them in a different way. My idea was that I'm going to design a drug that has flexible long ligands, different from what is in the literature, so that upon binding to a virus, these flexible ligand will bind in a multivalent way, which is what, by crystal structure, we know the attachment ligand is ready to accept. So multiple binding. And upon this binding, the large amphiphilic nature of the ligands we had designed will establish hydrophobic contact. This applies a pressure, and we all know that in virology, in a pressure is equivalent to the bursting of a virus. 
So what we are doing is a mechanical drug, not a chemical one, that locally applies a pressure to the virus. And the idea was to eventually lead to the virus bursting. Bursting is an irreversible event. So let me show you the results now. We compared our drug, so nanoparticle coated with long, flexible, highly amphiphilic ligands, with heparin, as I said, FDA approved the golden standard in this field, and with the gold nanoparticle that had short ligands. What we saw was the following. It, all three drugs in cell viability tests had no visible toxicity. If we did those array response, all three were nanomolar. But then we did a virucidal test. What is this test? We take from those plots the is IC9090 uh, concentration. So the concentration at which the drugs blocks two logs of infectivity. So we put a titer of viruses with that concentration of drug in a sample. In the other one, we put the same titer of virus. So at this point, these two samples have a difference in infectivity of 100-fold. Then we diluted, diluted, diluted this sample up to the last dilution where here in the control we could see an infection. And what we are plotting here is the infectivity of a control versus the control plus the drug. As you can see, even though I started with, 200, with 100 times two logs le less infectivity, upon dilution, all the effect of a drug is lost. That means that the, the drug reversibly detached from the virus and left infective viruses. That happened for heparin, happened for the short ligand viruses, but for our long amphiphilic ligand viruses, the infectivity was two logs less and was kept even upon dilution. And that was in a broad spectrum way. This property stayed against herpesimplex 2, papilloma virus, respiratory synthial virus, HIV, and dengue. And the effect is a cascade of long, uh, of of events that take time, because if I start doing the irreversibility effect at zero minute, it's mostly reversible. At five minutes, half of the effect is there, and only in half an hour, all of the effect is there. So it's a cascade of long-lasting events that leads to this irreversible effect. Now, graphically here, in cryo-TM, you can see what happens. The nanoparticle go around the virus, concentrate in places which we believe are the attachment ligand, I have no proof for that, and eventually lead to the bursting of a virus. That's what happens, and that's why this effect is irreversible. Now, of course, I started saying that I wanted to do this uh, because by doing it irreversibly, this would be medically relevant. Let's show the in vivo result. First, ex vivo, this is, these are the results on tissue of uh, patients, so uh, regrown at the air liquid interface. And what you can see here is that if we have a tissue that is infected by herpes simplex virus 2, if we use the short ligand nanoparticle, at time zero we can kill the inf infection, but after two days half of infection is back, at three days the whole infection is back. If we use our nanoparticle, at two days nothing is back and only a little bit is back at three days. And in fact, if we do it in post-treatment, um, we get complete co co coverage uh, protection even after three days. This works also in vivo, intranasal um, uh, injection on, the nano, on, the, on a mouse infected with respiratory synthial virus, a virus that starts the influenza, the pneumonia infection, and then kills half a million people every year, against which we have no vaccine and no drug, with a single intranasal injection of 10 micrograms of materials, we actually get full uh, protection of the lungs of the mouse. And I have to say that if you scale this to a human, this makes it two and a half milligram single injection. So we are really in the right way. At this point, I will conclude just by asking the hard question for a conference like this. Do we need nano? I asked this myself and I posed this challenge to my students because what I've taught you is that to make this physical fight of viruses, what I need is a supramolecular approach with long amphiphilic molecule at a certain density and rigidity. 
So what we did, we put the same ligands on beta-cyclodextrin, so something that is a molecule and that really has the same surface of a nanoparticle, and we could reproduce the whole results that we have on the nanoparticle, showing that you know, we can actually simplify this. I'm going to conclude here thanking all of the collaborators with this work, thanking the rest of my group and my funding agency, and thanking you for your attention. Yeah, please. Oh, yeah, so you're, you're not. So the, you were explaining the broad spectrum antiviral, uh -huh. uh, in which you, uh, I mean, the in Nature Nanomaterials you have yes. recently published. So uh, is there any question? Then, OK, please. Is it correct that you want to use this as a vaccine? No, no, no. Um, vaccines are okay. the best way to fight viruses, and we should uh, push for the development of vaccine. But once you, once you get a viral infection, if you're not vaccinated, a vaccine will not help you. Mm -hmm. So what we are trying to develop here is a drug. It's a drug for people that get the viral infection. For example, diarrhea, influenza, and things like that. But it, it will work then extracellularly, as you yes. said. And then you need to be present basically at the site where the virus will yes, be released. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. And that changes from virus to virus, and that's why we're working on various formulation to do that. So next step is going to be uh, the, to develop formulation the method and, uh, of the systemic this. delivery. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So do so. you think the systemic delivery of the nanoparticles are go uh, going to be possible? Or of cyclodextrin. We've shifted to molecules now, so okay. that, that can also be. So what I showed, for example, against RSV, RSV is a, uh, it's a local virus that infects only lungs, right? And we did aerospray in, uh, in injection to go where the virus is. It's not so simple for many other viruses. Okay, thank you. So. <laughs>